Let's get going. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Lumen, and I'm an attorney based in San Diego. Uh, every once in a while, I come across a criminal case, and I jump right back on in. So for me, that case was Glenn Sunkett's case. Uh, I have here with me Mr. Aaron Spolin of Spolin Law, based in Los Angeles, with his firm's focus being criminal appeals. Aaron also quite literally wrote the book on the many inaccuracies of eyewitness identifications, which come into play in a huge way in Glenn's case. Uh, Aaron is ranked as one of the top criminal attorneys, and he is currently representing Glenn in his pursuit of justice. And I have no doubt that Glenn's case will result in another win for Spolin Law. So Aaron, thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you for that kind introduction. I appreciate it. Of course. Uh, so we have a lot to unpack today. I just wanted to jump right on in. Um, if you could give us a very brief introduction introduction to the facts of this case uh, that the state has charged Glenn with being connected to. Absolutely. So he's charged with the kidnapping robbery case, really a, a robbery case, and they've added on a kidnapping. Um, and here is the big picture 10,000 feet view, uh, which is he's innocent. Uh, he did not do this. He was not there. He was not involved. And what this revolves around is a mistaken eyewitness uh, misidentification. That's kind of what this case is all about. And one of the interesting things about witness misidentification, and uh, Ms. Lumen did mention that I, I wrote a book about witness mis misidentification in criminal cases, um, is that cross-racial misidentifications are the most common, people identifying folks of another race. Uh, and that's for a number of psychological reasons, but that's what was the case here. It was a cross-racial misidentification. And that's why we're here, and that's why Glenn is in prison. Um, and so you know, the more the more people pay attention to this case and look at this case and try to learn about it, the more they see he shouldn't be there. Um, this was an injustice. And what can we do? What can everyone do to try to fight that? That's kind of the main question. Absolutely. So, so Glenn is erroneously convicted for the home invasion. He's convicted of charges related to that home invasion, and he's sentenced to 63 years. That is a lot. And I'm sure you get many, many potential clients claiming innocence. So what made you look at Glenn's case and believe that Glenn was actually innocent? Well, so pe many people claim innocence, of course, and so it's important to look at the facts and see what the facts are and what the facts support. But in Glenn's case, you look at the evidence and basically there, there's no evidence except for the misidentification, really the, the one witness identification. But it's not even a misidentification. I mean, it's a situation where there was a lot of ambiguity um, and the detective in the case sent an email with a picture of Glenn before the trial. It was really the trial identification that was the only one that had any appearance of um, strength as opposed to any earlier identifications, and that was after the email was sent. And this was a case where the officer, the detective, uh, sent a photo of Glenn. I mean, how are you not going to identify him if you see the photo? A, a single and photo, correct? What do you say? A single photo of only Glenn, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, after an ambiguous, uh, hesitant and tentative identification earlier, and then the email was sent and uh, basically commun communicating, this is the guy. And then there's the trial identification that results in the conviction. So to put it simply, how is this different from all the other clients who say they're innocent? Um, one way it's different is he's straight up innocent. And that's what the mm -hmm. facts show. Not saying the other clients are not innocent, but some are, some aren't, he is innocent. So, uh, and, and the facts show it. Right, I believe there's a distinction between not guilty and innocent. Not guilty meaning yeah. the prosecutor can't prove it as opposed to factually, legally in, innocent as we have with Glenn. So it's mm -hmm. an important distinction that, um, it's, oh boy, it's gotta pop up here. Um, that's important in Glenn's case, and much of which you've outlined in your petition for writ of habeas corpus, trying to get Glenn out of prison. Um, I've, I've gone through that petition and, wow, uh, embarrassing for the legal community for sure, uh, but it's not much of a justice system when you look at the petition that you've prepared. Um, it seems like there's really four core issues with Glenn's case. So we have the eyewitness identification errors, we have the highly suggestive identification procedures along with that. We have a plethora of issues and revolving around ineffective assistance of counsel. 
we have a lack of evidence to support the kidnapping charges and conviction and then we have the unjustified 63-year sentence so we you kind of dabbled on the um, out-of-court identification do you believe that um, this aspect the cross identity cross-racial identification um, do you believe that was the prosecutor's main source of how they received that successful conviction for sure absolutely that, that looked absolutely. like the key that unlocked that it. Is it yeah absolutely okay so it was the middle of the trial and i remember that the evidence had been disclosed to the defense attorney months and months and months in advance that a cross racial identification have occurred what would cause an attorney to delay to the middle of trial to wait to identify this issue uh, there are a number of possible reasons you know, i can't read it read the lawyer's mind so i don't know um, there are reasons that are that are kind of good reasons and bad reasons. I would say a bad reason is um, laziness. I'm not saying the lawyer was lazy because I don't know what the reason was. Okay. That gets a possible reason. Um, another reason could be belief that the client is guilty. So why waste your time? Uh, that's another possible reason. Another possible reason is um, not knowing how effective that would be. Um, another reason could have been uh tactical if this were the only thing the lawyer did wrong you know you might think oh maybe it's a strategic choice to wait until the middle and then get a big delay but um that with this particular case i don't think that was the reason it doesn't make any sense because of all the other mistakes um but i i guess probably the main thing that i would guess as the reason is just not sufficient knowledge of the power of expert witnesses on a topic like this um, are you aware if the issue came up and the uh, defense attorney decided to proceed with that route once the witness, the white witness, testified that she believed it was Glenn because Glenn had, and this is another quote, standard Negroid features, whatever that may mean. Um, was that when there was an issue regarding the expert or are you not aware? Well, I mean, that that is obviously time she, she she lawyer should have raised it well before that it's not like that is the time when it should have been raised you know any cross racial identification uh an expert would be appropriate but a statement like that shows that it isn't even like a normal cross racial identification it's someone basically saying oh it's, it's a black person that did it he's black mm -hmm. that, that's what that statement means now i don't know if that person's racist or not and that's not really relevant what's relevant is that race was used as a proxy for guilt in this case um, because it is an admission that you know the the black features are why that happened so yeah that is that is sad and heart-wrenching to you know hear that type of language and to see the type of language in the record absolutely i mean so you can look at the culmination of all of the actions that the attorney did or did not take not necessarily one specific action um, one mm -hmm. of the ones that stuck out to me personally was that there was uh, independent evidence of third party guilt, which the attorney did not investigate. I mean, there was a recording there was that was provided to the prosecutor. It could have been used in court. There was a letter written admitting guilt in a coded way, but that could have been admitted. None of that was admitted as well, which seems like a huge red flag is that in and of itself shows that Glenn was innocent. Uh, well, yes, I mean, thing, anything that shows he's innocent is something that should have been brought up by the lawyer. I think many of the things that were not done uh, were enough by themselves to show ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, you know, there are, there are cases of ineffective assistance of counsel where lawyers have slept through significant portions of death penalty murder cases. Lawyers have been drunk throughout, um, you know, cases like smell of alcohol on their breath. There are there are just crazy horror stories of things that have happened, and so what one needs to find justice is judges who are are brave enough to say, you know what, I know someone's accused of a very heinous crime, but gosh darn it, that lawyer's performance was so so bad that we need to do this over again. One of the things that I think makes Glenn's case such um, a strong case is that not only do we have these open and shut case of ineffective assistance of counsel, but it's not even like a judge has to um, think, well, technically the person, the right, the rights were violated, but they're guilty, but you know, I got to go with the law. It's not even in one of those cases. It's the rights are violated 
and he's innocent. And they really tie together um, because you, if you had a lawyer who was just gung ho aggressive, this was the only, their only case in the world, um, and they knew they knew everything that they were supposed to do. Of course, he would not have been found uh, guilty. But yeah, it's 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 crazy kind of what can happen in terms of the realm of lawyering. Right. Absolutely. Um, another another failure that I think is important is that Glenn was convicted by an all white jury, which in and of itself seems like a constitutional violation right there, flat out the gate. Um, and then that jury was polled and said that it was the cross racial factors that really sealed the deal for them. It's sad. Uh, again, there, uh, a, a Batson challenge, a challenge to the construction of the jury, or even the construction of the jury pool, um, or the way that challenges, both peremptory challenges and for cause challenges are issued by the prosecutor. Those are all things that could be raised and litigated. Those are important you know, topics to discuss. Um, and what you hint at is there are also structural problems. There are structural problems with the system. You know, the system we have now is is basically the same system we had when the country was founded. Obviously, there have been changes. You know, the, the more people can be on the jury, juror or the jury uh, can be part of the jury pool. Um, but it's it, it's a system that is not built uh, for the multiracial society that we have now. It's a system that was basically built for the society that we had in the, you know, 17, et cetera, 1776, 1789, um, when the country's uh, the trial by jury system was, you know, implemented. It was a very um, innovative thing at that time. It was not commonly used. Obviously, it was not used in England. It's still not used in England, um, where we kind of, many of our laws came from. Um, yeah, so there are systemic problems in the justice system, and that touches upon one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and discuss the kidnapping charges. So mm -hmm. under California law, kidnapping is basically moving another person by force or fear with, without consent um, to another country, state, county, or within the same part of the county. So for Glenn's case, ignoring the innocence factor, um, this aspiration or movement element was not present at all. Uh, was there anything on the record reflecting any support of this kidnapping charge when there was no movement? How did that kidnapping, char four kidnapping charges, which were, I believe, 40 years of Glenn's 63 year sentence, was there anything on the record that supported those kidnapping charges? Uh, I guess it depends on how you look at it. If you are to say that anyone who moved any hair, um, you know, when when they were kind of confined in the course of a robbery or in the course of a home invasion or whatever it is, that person has been kidnapped. If that were the definition of kidnapping, then sure, and every single robbery in the world would be a kidnapping, and every single home invasion, and every single, um, you know, that type of thing. Now that's not the case because. We have different crimes for different circumstances. And if someone is robbed, of course they're constrained in some way. You know, if you snatch someone's purse, you're gonna move their hand if you snatch the purse out of their hand. Um, it, I guess a 99.9% .9 of purse snatchings. Um, if you are doing a home invasion, a uh, person, usually people are ordered around to do things, to you know, lie down, um, to put their hands above their head, whatever it is. Uh, and so those are things that cannot and should not give rise to a separate charge of kidnapping because it, it's not a separate crime. It's basically this was the robbery. And so one of the most important points about this case is that, you know, whoever did this, and it wasn't Glenn, but whoever did this, they didn't kidnap anyone. And it's kind of awkward to phrase this because, you know, right. it, it's it's hard to say, well, even if Glenn did it, he couldn't have kidnapped him because I don't like phrasing it like that because, you know, even though that's how you're supposed to phrase it for the courts, it's it, a better way to phrase it is whoever whoever did this didn't kidnap anybody um, because of that and because it was just a, a run of the, you know, typical robbery, uh, typical home invasion type situation uh, where there's going to be a little bit of ordering and, and someone's going to move a muscle. Uh, but it, but it's not a kidnapping, you know, putting someone in the trunk of your car and then driving. We all know what a kidnapping is. You know, you know what it is from just um, being alive in the world and, you know, us mm -hmm. being adults. And 
Uh, and it's basically when you forcibly move somebody and the moving is an important part of what you're doing and it's not part of some other crime, except perhaps something happening at the end, you can kidnap someone and then something else happens. Um, so essentially there wasn't a kidnapping. Whoever did this did not kidnap anybody. Um, and certainly whoever did exactly what the prosecutor thinks that Glenn did, uh, didn't commit a kidnapping. So that's kind of one of the main problems. Now, prosecutors routinely will overcharge people. Overcharging is when um, the prosecutor charges some, someone with more than even what the evidence would support. And this is a case of overcharging. Um, the defense of that, or I guess the way to stop that from happening is a strong defense attorney and a strong and principled judge who would not allow that. Um, the jury a little bit, but jurors are not going to really understand the distinction there and how, you know, you can't have a crime inside another crime and they get mm -hmm. separate punishments for that. Uh, so it's really the judge and the lawyer and that just didn't happen here. Glenn did say that the, uh, by way of jury instructions, the judge informed the jury that the kidnapping required intent and that had to be the primary intent of the intruders. But, you know, I guess that just went right over their head. That's a lot to expect of a jury who has no legal background at all. Uh, if I had no legal background, I probably would not know the difference either. Yeah. And that's one of the interesting things there is that the job of the judge is to only give jury instructions that are appropriate. That was not an appropriate jury instruction because there was no evidence to support that. And the judge's job is to weed out that. Prosecutors ask for all sorts of jury instructions. The defense lawyers ask for different sets of jury instructions. The judge needs to be the shot caller to say what is appropriate. That wasn't appropriate because it wasn't supported by the evidence. And you can then see the result. You can see what the danger is of inappropriate jury instructions. The jury just saying, oh, you know, someone moved their, a muscle, so it's kidnapping. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then he gets all this extra time. Right. I mean, the, this case, whoever did this should have been capped at 19 years, uh, according to your petition. I don't see how it could have been any more than 19 years, especially 63. And I mean, if you're looking at crimes today, I have seen people get far, far less for much more heinous crimes. Um, so this is really a, a sentencing issue. And I know that there's a lot of talk about sentencing reform, especially in California, because sentencing in California is so confusing and convoluted and overly aggressive um, that it's very hard to even figure out a sentence when you're looking at sentencing law. So hopefully we can get some sentencing reform going and that will help future cases. That doesn't help Glenn right now. But hopefully Glenn is going to be out pretty soon with your help. <laughs> well, I, I hope so. Yeah, and he deserves it. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned about new laws, yes, there are many new laws passing all the time. You know, the California legislature is, has gone on a flurry of new law passages, and uh, some of them are retroactive, which means they apply to the past, as I'm sure you know. So mm -hmm. if a new law were to come out on any number of topics that are relevant here, including double, you know, double sentencing for one crime, um, one would hope that they'd be retroactive. And mm -hmm. so that's something that people can look out for. That's uh, one of the ways people can help. There are many ways people can help. You know, one way is to sign a, a petition supporting Glenn, obviously. There's a petition on change.org. If you Google Glenn Sunkit, you'll be able to see it. Another way they can support him is by writing a letter of support for him and sending it to him uh, I guess they could send it to you or they could send it to me uh, to put together to kind of have an advocacy package. Uh, that's a very important thing that anybody, you don't need to know him, you just need to know about his case, uh, to, you know, write a letter about him. Uh, because if a new law could be passed that affects him, that's retroactive, um, that would be huge. Even if, you know, he's still a innocent person who's in, in prison, uh, but at least for the crime that someone did and not for an impossible crime or something that no one did. Right. Um, so I won't take up any more of your time. Is there anything else that you wanted to add that maybe I missed or you think is important to Glenn's case? Yes, this is one other thing. Anyone who's watching this right now, um, I, I don't know in what medium this is going to play, uh, but anyone who's watching this, I hope this has been interesting, but you can actually do something to help him. And, you know, you can make your day a very meaningful day. If you reach out to him, he has a website. If you write a letter for him about your opinion, your opinion does matter. You know, if, if we're going to get a new law passed in the future 
and we can get a letter from you, you know, whoever you are listening to this, uh, about how you support Glenn and his case. That can show an assemblyman, a uh, state senator, uh, the governor, Governor Gavin Newsom, that there's just one more voter who cares about this. Uh, and so, you know, to help move the needle on this. So that's kind of the one thing I would add. This is not just a sob story. This is something where it's in the middle of the story. We're in the middle of the story right now. And anyone can help him. And I hope people do. Mm -hmm. Well, if you'd like more information, as Aaron mentioned, you can just simply Google Glenn Sunkett. He's everywhere. He's got a website. He's got a change.org petition. And we encourage you to uh, sign his petition and review the aspects of this case. It's really interesting. I really appreciate your time, Aaron, explaining everything. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Amanda. Good to speak with you. Take care. Thank you, too.